COVID, um, I wasn't able to access them. So the grant allowed me to uh, uh, establish a connection with the Eastview Press, which is the, um, the publisher that holds the, ar uh, the digital archives of the Rafa Shimpo. And I was able to negotiate a price. Uh, so I was able to work on this for six weeks during the, uh, the holidays, November, December, um, and some part of January. So they were very flexible and uh, I appreciated that. Um, there are 68 slides in my presentation, so I might skip some of them. Um, I mean, I will uh, keep them in the sense that uh, I will, uh, you know, I need to stop for a second, actually. I am so sorry, because I didn't start recording, uh, Amanda. Mm -hmm. Sorry. That's okay. I'm recording onto the cloud, so don't worry. Oh, okay, yeah, because I can't record here. It's there. Okay. I can. okay, all right. Sorry about that. Um, let's go back into presentation mode. Here we go. So my research work, as uh, many of you know, focuses on the uh, history of Japanese American, Japanese and Japanese American citizens as victims or survivors of the Hiroshima Tommy bombing. And the book um, will come out eventually. Um, in the book, I look at uh, the, the histories of this uh, Amer Japanese American citizens, why they were in Hiroshima, uh, how they returned back to the United States, um, and then at the social movement to obtain medical relief from both the Japanese and American government, the creation of the two coalitions, uh, the first uh, in the 1970s, and then the second one, the continuation of the first one in the, 19, uh, in the 1990s. So, but the issue that I had at the outset was with a timeline. I had issues to understand the timeline of events. And so when I started working on this project, whoever I was interviewing was giving me a different timeline. And so I realized that in order for me to understand what was happening and how this happened, how this individual organized in order to request medical uh, relief from both the Japanese and the American government, I had to pin down uh, specific dates. At the time, and currently the only books available are uh, one by a professor, a Japanese professor, uh, Dr. Professor Sode Rinjiro, which was uh, translated in English in 1998, but it relies on research conducted in the 1970s. And the other one is by Dr. Ito Chikako, who was part of the medical mission to the United States to provide medical relief to the atomic bomb survivors. What she does, and I will explain more uh, later, she does give a chronology of events and she bases everything off uh, Japanese publications. But then there are the individuals that I interviewed. And so, um, and all those individuals that were active in the, um, in the groups that uh, I mentioned before. Um, and some of them kept very good uh, notes like Mr. Kaname Shimoda, um, Mr. Arai. Um, other people I interviewed him, for example, Mr. Sarashina, I, I have over 12 hours of interviews with him. Uh, and with Ms. Okabe, I, I would go back and forth. And then there's uh, Ms. Kaz Sueshi, who passed away in 2016, but her daughter gave me about 20 boxes of primary sources. And I've been going through, uh, through them uh, this past years. But for the purpose of this presentation, so these are my research questions. So what are, um, I, I will focus on the 1946, 1971 uh, years. Um, and I chose this time period in order to explain how a atomic bomb survivors uh, organized. So this, um, I will, as we were look, we're gonna go through the articles that I picked. We'll see how, uh, the kind of background, the social and political background uh, that uh, allowed these individuals to get together to form this movement. Um, what were these people, uh, how were these people getting information about what was happening in Japan as far as atomic bomb survivors were concerned? Um, why did I choose the Rafu Shimpo, which is a Japanese American uh, newspaper? And most important is how did they have access to the information from Japan? And so these are some of the questions that I will cover in my presentation. Um, this is an article from 1977, front page of the Rafu Shimpo. Um, 
and there'll be more like that. But before uh, I begin, I'd like to define who, who are these atomic bomb survivors in the United States. So they are American citizens of Japanese ancestry, meaning that they were born in the United States. And they can be like Nisei, second generations, like Mr. Sarashina, who was born in Hawaii, or they could be Sansei, uh, like Mr. Arai, who was also born uh, in, in Hawaii. They can be Japanese nationals residing in the United States, which means that they, they are green card holders. And this could be businessmen and their wives or Japan born wives of Japanese American men or Japan born wives of Caucasian American men. Um, or like Miss uh, uh, Okai Tomoe, who was a Japanese nationals that married uh, Anisei. Then we have naturalized Japanese nationals. So those are individuals that took American citizenship when they moved to the United States for personal reason, for marriage, or for uh, business. I also would like to define my working definition uh, of transnationalism and then explain why I'm using the Rafa Shimpo. Transnational, transnationalism in Asian American history isn't in reality anything new, but I am using, er, using Erika Lee and Aoko Shibusawa's understanding of trans, transnationalism in Asian American history, and I adapted it to my research work. And I understand it as the, uh, transnationalism relates to history about Japanese nationals and Japanese American in the United States and their ongoing economic, cultural, ethnic, and political networks and relationship with those in Japan. Um, the focus is on the stories and the historical context in Japan as well as in the United States, as I will explain. And also, uh, I won't look at this much, but it also exact focuses on Japanese migration. This is a, a topic that I address more in, um, in my book and not necessarily today. Um, the purpose, the, the, this uh, understanding of transnationalism is uh, to see how uh, people uh, are connected uh, from place to place, how people connect to each other uh, in the United States and uh, in Japan. Um, why the Rafu Shimpo? Uh, the Rafu Shimpo uh, is the longest uh, running Japanese American newspapers in the United States. It was founded in 1903 by three uh, USC students. Um, and until 1926, it was published just in Japanese. So it was, it was only 1926 that uh, uh, English section was added. And the paper has um, and had an English editor and a Japanese editor, and the two sections are totally uh, independent to, of one another. Publication was suspended during World War II from April 4, 1942 until December 31st, 1945. It resumed in January 1st, 1946, and that's a very important date uh, for me. In 1988, uh, Naomi Hirahara, who's a, a best writer and bestseller, uh, became the editor of the English section. And when she uh, took charge of the English section of the uh, Rafa Shimpo, uh, she really started focusing on the Asian American community voices. And I have talked with Naomi Hirara extensively and she has provided great uh, input uh, for uh, my work. But the, the, con the other issue is that I'm using a newspaper as a historical source. And some people might have an issue with that because they say that newspaper, uh, you know, are, they, they're not so reliable, that the people that are writing the articles bring in their biases, uh, which sounds like historians anyway. But for me, the issue was about using the newspaper in order to build a timeline and then check and counter check the information that uh, I, obtain from this uh, research and create, uh, as I said, a, a timeline. In order for me also to understand what was behind the movement to create uh, this, uh, the, this, the start of this, move, uh, this movement, uh, the content of the articles in the newspaper uh, was also important. So as I researched through the Rafu Shimpo, uh, from January 1st, 1946 until December 30th, 2019, I came across 1,043 articles, editorials, in English and in Japanese. 
keywords searched in English are the following, um, and I'm not going to read them all uh, for you. Um, this, I would enter the words and articles will pop up and I would just uh, isolate the articles and enter into a data, uh, into a, a folder with the date and the title. And these were the Japanese uh, words that I searched uh, in the newspaper. It's not an accurate search, and I will explain why, because not all the articles that had this words in it showed up. But what I found when I put the numbers down was the ability to create a, a chart. So, which will tell us when uh, the newspapers publish more uh, articles that related to the atomic bomb, atomic bomb survivor. And so there are peaks. So if you look at this charts, the first peak is uh, around 1955. Um, 1955, 1956, and that's 1954, and that's the uh, when Castle Bravo uh, it's, uh, nuclear test, thermonuclear text, uh, test uh, took place in the Marshall Islands. Um, it, this was also the time of the Hiroshima uh, maidens. Um, the second peak is around 1975, 78, and that's the congressional hearings. Uh, that were conducted for uh, to obtain medical relief for the atomic bomb survivors in the United States. The third peak, which is the highest one, is 1995. And so articles both in English, and as you can see, mostly in English than in Japanese, were published that related to the Enola Gay controversy, which was the, um, exhibit, the exhibition of the plane that dropped the, the bomb on Hiroshima in 1945, and the controversy that um, fall, it followed uh, for being um, uh, displayed at the Smithsonian. So that was a big deal. After that, we have other peaks uh, of uh, articles published and correspond mostly to the uh, commemoration anniversary, um, one in 2005, and then the 2015. As I say, the, my search is by no means complete because it's not scientifically uh, sound in the sense that I I still need to go back into the Rafa Shimpo uh, and really go through the article, through the uh, newspapers uh, uh, issues individually uh, and make sure that there are an article that I, I missed. But in, in a way, the, the Rafa Shimpo, because the movement started in Southern California and because the Rafa Shimpo is a Southern California publication that did uh, obtain national uh, coverage, uh, it will help me uh, to uh, really understand uh, the background upon which this individual organized and really understand the community work that went behind it. So why Hiroshima? The reason for Hiroshima is that I don't spend much time in this presentation, but uh, suffice to say that uh, historically, uh, uh, California, the West Coast of the United States and the, the islands of Hawaii uh, were the places where most individual from the Hiroshima prefecture migrated uh, from the end of the 19th century uh, until the 1930s. And mostly they would come from that area and for also from the Yamaguchi prefecture. Um, there are books that have been written about it. I focus more on this in, in my book, but this is the reason why um, I'm focusing on individual from uh, Hiroshima. As far as a timeline of events, so history we know is about change and continuity. It's about lesson learned, what to discard and what to present, preserve. But it's also the importance of assigning specific dates as month, day, and year to specific events in order to understand the evolution, the progression, the development, the social, political, and historical movement. So for example, when we have the event as the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the movement that you know, originated from that was the global and the local movement to abolish nuclear weapon. And so that's what I'm trying to understand, you know, what came before the movement that was spearheaded uh, in Southern California by this Japanese American uh, um, citizens and uh, the reason behind it. So 
the Rafa Shimpo started a publication again on January 1st, 1946. And as of January 3rd, 1946, that's when we see the first article in English showing up in the, uh, in the paper. And he introduces the news about some, a couple of Japanese American uh, uh, citizens who were victim of the atomic bombing in Hiroshima. On January 12, 1946, we have the news of a Sir, uh, Sergeant Sasano, who was a Japanese American citizen who entered uh, Hiroshima and he provided uh, an account of what, uh, of what he saw. But in Jan on January 24, 1946, for the first time, a map of the city of Hiroshima is published. And this is actually taken from the Asso International Associated Press. And so um, for those of you that are familiar with the city of Hiroshima, you can kind of see the, uh, the, the rivers that run through it. This explained is, is a translation from the English into Japanese of uh, the, the different areas of uh, Hiroshima where the IPO Center was, uh, where the most damage, uh, damage was. It's, it's really a scientific uh, map. On February 2nd, 1946, uh, in what appears to be a press release from Tokyo, um, the Supreme Allied uh, commander uh, released the following number about uh, the Hiroshima bombing. And um, it sets, remember this is 1946, at 306,545 casualties. Casualties meaning uh, people that were uh, affected by the bombing. But these numbers will change time and time and again. So they are not really uh, set in stones. And as a matter of fact, they are on the, uh, on the small uh, number. They're not on the highest one. But it's in June 1947 that we start getting the news of uh, Japanese American atomic bomb survivors returning to the United States. And June 2nd, 19, uh, 1947, uh, we learned that the first Japanese American to return a sorry, atomic bomb survivor was Nishikawa Toru. And he gives a pretty detailed account of his experience. On June 9, 1947, in what is for the first time an article in both English and Japanese, we get a list of names of individuals that um, returned from Japan and specifically from Hiroshima. These two articles are important because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Professor Sode does uh, mention these two individuals in his book. And as a matter of fact, he interviewed uh, Ms. Sadako Kobata extensively. Apparently, he wasn't able to locate uh, Mr. Tojo uh, Nishikawa. But the history of Sadako Kobata is uh, really uh, conveyed in, um, in, in the book that Professor Sode uh, wrote. So slowly, information is trickling in. Uh, in September 15, 1947, uh, we learned that a young Japanese American is rushed home in order for her to enroll in school. But what we also learn is that her father, who was an employee of the Rafa Shimpo, was killed in, uh, in Hiroshima. So at, at this time, um, we are getting also information in 1947 uh, about the health of atomic bomb victims. And this is because the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission was established in 1946 uh, by a presidential directive. And uh, it was created for research and study, not to provide medical care to atomic bomb survivors. And it was dissolved in 1975, but it was then renamed Radiation Effect Research Foundation. So slowly, um, we're also getting uh, First and testimony, account testimony. The first one that is uh, is conveyed in English by William Yamauchi is very interesting because he was a young man, 17 years of age. Uh, he was not in Hiroshima. He was on the other side of the mountains. But when he entered the city uh, two months later, um, he remembers that experience and. 
he was taking uh, English classes at, uh, at Pasadena City College and uh, his teachers in, in English as a second language class asked him to give a presentation. And so this is the first report in English language that uh, William Yamauchi provides. But this was not the only case. Many uh, young people will be asked to give personal account uh, later on and it will be conveyed in the, uh, in the Japanese media. But around 1950s, the early 1950s, that's when the news of atomic bomb disease starts appearing in the Japanese section of the Rafael Shimpu, not in the English section, in the Japanese section. So the article dated January 1st, 1953, um, talks about atomic bomb disease and how there isn't a support law yet. There isn't a law that really helps the survivors medically or financially. This article goes in depth in the description of atomic bomb illness. It covers several issues, including mental health. It describes the damages done to the body by radioactivity in graphic details. Um, it also points out how the bone marrow can become affected by radiation and what it takes to recover and to get better. The picture um, that is in this, uh, the first article, January 1st, 1953, is about uh, young girls at an identify, unidentified hospital in Tokyo. Um, they are holding hope for a certain type of plastic surgery. Um, on the April 20, 1953, uh, introduces the terminology of atomic bomb, A-bomb disease uh, to, uh, to the world. It is between 1948 and 1953 that the majority of Japanese American uh, citizens returned to the United States. And um, this was made possible uh, because they were minors during, uh, up until 1945, uh, they were able to show that uh, they were born uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the United States. Or some of them, as I say, that was the case of Miss Okai Tomoe. She married a Japanese American uh, citizen and she, uh, she moved to the United States. But what is interesting about the 1950s, in particular by 1954, is that during this time, the United States was conducting nuclear experiments in the Pacific Ocean and, and short articles in English had appeared about the military maneuvers in the, in the Marshall Islands, but in, there were concerns about radioactive fallout, but it wasn't until 1954 that uh, public voices started really vocalizing their concerns. Let's remember the United States was conducting uh, this test uh, since 1948 in the Marshall Island. So on January 6, um, 1954, um, it's an article that really conveyed the, uh, the situation of, atom of chronic atomic bomb disease. Um, and uh, we are being introduced to Dr. Suzuki Masao, who, who was the one uh, that was working at the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission as well. And we're also informed about his book, uh, in 10 chapters that address atomic bomb wounds, land contamination, chronic atomic bomb disease, and genetic effects. Well, the article dated, which is one in the middle of January 14, 1954, um, is introduces, uh, it discusses the first Japan-US debate on atomic bomb disease um, that will, uh, was going to be uh, uh, taking place uh, on the following February. And January 20, 1954, um, discusses the treatment of atomic bomb disease um, and he announces that the Dr. Suzuki's book research will be published in, um, in English. So why is this important? This is important because March 1st, 1954, is when uh, Castle Bravo, uh, the thermonuclear uh, weapon test in Bikini Atoll. And what happened with this is that the fallout impacted a, a Japanese fishing vessel, the Lucky Dragon number no. five. And uh, uh, when you look at this, uh, at, at this graph here, um, it is said that the uh, radioactivity, uh, that the radio, uh, radioactivity contained in the Castle Bravo uh, bomb, which by the way, um, it was uh, uh, wrongly uh, measured, uh, was the equivalent of one Hiroshima bomb dropped on the Marshall Island every day for 12 and a half consecutive years. So that was the damage that was done by uh, 
Castle Bravo. So the fishing vessel Lucky Dragon number no. five found itself in the uh, in the path of the uh, the radioactive cloud, and so this uh, started uh, the public started it became a big issue. And the Rafa Shimpo started publishing articles both in the English section and in the Japanese uh, section. And so a lot of information started to st starting to come out. And as a result, as a matter of fact, of um, the uh, Lucky Dragon number no. five, that's when the uh, Atomic Bomb Survivor Special Medical Care Law was enacted uh, in Japan. Um, in 1955, Dr. Suzuki, of course, uh, uh, wrote that Japan was the number one uh, in, the, uh, in the development of atomic bomb disease because of the three experiences, which were Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Castle Bravo. Um, the second from the right in this picture is Dr. Uh, Suzuki, and he was uh, important in the first uh, uh, in the study that were first released on genetic testing. Uh, in um, they were conducted in uh, in Japan. But as I said before, the, the number uh, about the casualty of Hiroshima and Nagasaki will always be uh, reconsidered and reviewed. And, um, and this will become a, a point of contention between the, uh, the, Ameri the American scientists and the Japanese uh, scientists. But the articles that keep trickling in is about this, you know, of course, radiation fever. Um, there was also uh, called neurosis uh, or noirose in, uh, in Japanese. What this did mean, um, so um, for the purpose of treating uh, atomic bomb survivors, the Red Cross opened the Hiroshima Atomic Bomb Hospital in September 1956. And then, as I said, the Atomic Bomb Survivor Special Medical Care Law um, was enacted in 1957 and amended in 1960, but it applied only to Japanese citizens in Japan. And for eligibility was only uh, by falling into four specific categories um, by which people could obtain the atomic bomb certificate. Um, and when it was enacted, uh, foreign nationals who were in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945 were not eligible to apply. But so when it comes to the, the numbers, how many people were victim of, uh, fell victim of the atomic bomb? As of March, 2020, the Japanese government recognized 650,000 people as atomic bomb survivors. And those of those 650,000, 136,682 were still alive on August 4, 2020, and were and are were mostly uh, Japanese. But so throughout the years, a lot of studying long, uh, lifelong care study were conducted by the ABCC on children to see, uh, you know, if genetic testing, uh, genetic uh, um, diseases and pathology would develop. August 6, 1959 is the first time that uh, an article, a long article in the Japanese uh, section explains what is Bura Bura disease. Bura Bura in, in Japanese, um, it means like an unexplained fatigue uh, caused by radiation exposure. So be, patients will, beca will become lethargic, easily fatigued, impatient, um, even as they seem clinically normal, but they, they will catch colds easily. They will take a long time to recover. It, this condition will make it very difficult for them to continue working. Um, then their conditions will suddenly deteriorate. Um, some of them would just die unexpectedly. Um, there were many cases in which patients would catch a cold and then uh, develop uh, a fatal case of tuberculosis. Uh, and this illness haunted thousands of atomic bomb survivors, including, including those that had escaped a direct blast. Um, but so those who exhibited the symptoms will fall, will feel uh, too tired to work or even stand up. Um, and these patients uh, were usually called lazy. And this was really the kind of treatment that uh, was happening in the United States when the atomic bomb survivors that returned to the United States will go see doctors for some of these pathologies. And they say that they were just suffering from neurosis or they were lazy. Uh, that uh, they didn't know what they were talking about. 
But the issue was that uh, the American doctors really didn't know what atomic bomb disease was. So in, in this article that was published on August 6, 1959, um, this was uh, also the first time that a report was published that took into consideration um, the, the medical, the economic, economical and political implication of an atomic bomb uh, being deployed on a city. And the, the, the questions that also were answered, uh, that they were posed at the time is that what kind of physical damage was suffered by these atomic bomb survivors? What kind of disease is the atomic bomb disease? Um, what kind of suffering is there in the lives of the survivors? And um, how far has the medical, emotional, financial relief for the atomic bomb survivor progressed? And so even in, in, in Japan, there still wasn't uh, much. So between 1960 and 1964, um, there are several articles that are being published in, uh, in the Rafa Shimpo that look at the research that's being done on atomic bomb survivors or the data that is being gathered and the studies that are informed by that data. Um, and it's interesting how between this four or five years, um, I wasn't able to find any single article in Japanese. And, this tells me that I need to go back and physically look at the, uh, at the individual issues in the newspapers. But so um, it, was, it would be interesting that only uh, uh, in English section, we will see this kind of essays. So 1965 comes around, uh, summer 1965, um, this where the article published in the, uh, in the Rafa Shimpo at the time. And 1965 is the year uh, when um, the Japanese, Amer Japanese nationals and Japanese Americans residing in Southern California uh, put an announcement in the uh, Japanese American newspaper, the Rafu Shimpo, and another one, which was the Kashu Mainichi, and um, calling for people that had experienced the, uh, the atomic bomb to, to get together, to, um, you know, to share information, to, you know, to talk uh, in a sense. But my, in my interview with Mr. Satoru Arai, uh, he said that this getting together was supposed to be a drinking fellowship. In other words, it was supposed to be a group of men getting together and enjoying sake, you know, J Japan rice wine. Um, Mr. Arai, in conversation with me over this past five years, uh, has told me that there was this belief uh, that sake could help with taking out radiation sickness, or at least that was his father had told them. Mr. Shimoda instead, whose name is the one on the right in the, on this slide, um, still claims that um, August 6th is the day for the survivors to commemorate the accident of their survival. That's what he conveyed to, the, to Professor Sode back in the 70s, and that's what he told me as well. So the commemoration of the accident of their survival. I'm relying on uh, Shimoda's uh, uh, note to uh, convey information about the first meeting that was called for August 12, 1965. First of all, very few people attended this meeting as it was the day after the riots broke out in the Watts, uh, which is an area of South Central LA, Los Angeles, and the riots went on for six days. Traffic was impacted. People did not want to be out on the town at the time. And because most uh, uh, Japanese Americans and Japanese nationals lived in the Orange County on the southern side of, uh, uh, of, of Cal Southern California, they would have had to take freeways to get to Mr. Shimoda's house, which was in Pasadena. And accordingly, only people that were in the neighborhood of Mr. Shimoda's house were able to attend this meeting. And Mr. Arai was one of them, as well as Mr. Rakuno. So from Mr. Shimoda's notes, it's interesting to see how, you know, they went around the room asking individuals, why do they want to join this group? And Mr. Arai conveyed that, you know, he was looking for friendship, people that he could talk to that had the same experience of the atomic bombing. Mr. Rakuna say that, you know, he wanted to work toward a call for world peace. Mr. Shimoda's concern was about the medical protection, protection for those that had um, experienced the bomb. 
Um, it took two years though, uh, before this group of individuals in Southern California uh, really uh, were able to put together a program as to what they wanted. And it was uh, Tomoe Okai, um, who in 1967 visited her family in Hiroshima. And uh, she met with the mayor, uh, Yamada. And uh, um, she asked the mayor for help in obtaining medical help for atomic bomb survivors in North America. Uh, mayor Yamada, Yamada promised to help and his statement will speak type by the uh, Hiroshima newspaper, the Chugoku Shimbun, the Associated Press. And it was printed in Japanese and in English in the uh, October 4, 1967 issue of the Rafa Shimpo. Um, Ms. Okai also visited the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission, and the reason she did that was because she wanted to know if there was any uh, American uh, doctor living in Los Angeles that had done some kind of training at the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission, and of course that would end up being Dr. Yamazaki. So this is a picture of uh, Ms. Okai Tomoe meeting with the uh, uh, mayor of uh, Hiroshima in 1967. As you notice on the right, on the left-hand side, there are two articles from the Rafa Shimpo and they are dated November 30, 1967. These two articles were not picked up by my keyword search. I was able to, I found these two articles actually in Mr. Shimoda's uh, binder in his personal papers. So once again, this tells me that I need to really go back uh, to the uh, Rafa Shimpo, especially certain years and certain dates, now that I have most of the dates available, to find what was happening um, at the time. But so in 19, um, oops, sorry. In uh, 1969, um, uh, mayor Yamada, the Hiroshima uh, mayor, which is pictured in this, uh, in this photograph here on this slide, uh, promises that he will help, he will do his best to provide some help to the survivors in, um, in North America. And as a matter of fact, uh, on, uh, in 1969, on October 20th, um, he says he's traveling uh, to the United States, but uh, he decides to meet with the survivors in uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and in Honolulu on his return trip to, uh, to Japan. So this slides in a way shows the work that how complicated the work gets after 1969. September 20, 1969, a little blurb in the Rafa Shimpo says that uh, Hiroshima city government had published uh, almost a 500 page article, a uh, book documented the experience of, of the victim and survivors. On October 20, um, the Hiroshima mayor say he wants to meet with atomic bomb survivors. Then on October 24, 1969, and the, and the, the uh, Rafa Shimpo does not convey this. Um, and I get this from Dr. Ito Chikako's uh, uh, chronology. Uh, we know that the mayor wants to meet uh, with the survivors in the three American cities. Um, and on November 4th, the, the mayor talks about the steps to dispense medical treatment to Japanese American survivors through a dispatch of doctors from Medical Association from Japan. So this is missing from, uh, from the Rafa Shimpo. This is uh, uh, an example also, uh, this is the, uh, the bylaws of the Committee of Atomic Bomb Survivors in the United States that was formed in October 13, 1971. Um, and uh, thanks to Mr. Arai, uh, he provided me with a copy in English and in Japanese to show uh, the work that was being done. But the survivors started writing also essay in the Rafu Shimpo. So Kaname Shimoda, for example, he publishes a two-part um, uh, personal uh, account of uh, the bombing and the need for uh, medical relief in the uh, October uh, 29th and October 30th, 1971. This is a very personal and graphic account of his experience with the atomic bomb. He also conveyed the dilemma of so many survivors outside Japan who are unable to get the medical help that they, they, they need. Uh, Shimoda's writing is uh, very down to earth, easy to relate to. It is a personal account. It, it does come across as angry at times, hopeless some other times. 
Um, I met him with him in March 2019, and when we met, he did not speak one word of English with me. Um, he spoke mostly in the Hiroshima dialect. Um, but what touched me the most was the fact that when he showed me the picture of one of his elementary school uh, friend that died on August 6, 1945, he, he started crying um, unconsolably, and his tears were genuine, as, as was his despair. To, to show that the pain is still there and he experienced it and it is tangible. So this is a picture of some of the, the individuals that I mentioned uh, in, in today's presentation and I'm still trying to identify some, uh, some of them. Um, and so these are the individuals that will play uh, a big role do, um, when it comes to the medical expedition and to the congressional hearings in the, 19, uh, in the 1970s. But so uh, what is the danger of relying on one source only for to create a timeline? So this is an example of the timelines that I created based on the, my findings from the Rafu Shimpo and the translation of Dr. Ito uh, chronology. So I am filling in the gaps, trying to understand what happened a specific period of time. So. Mr. Shimoda, for example, gave me his papers and he has this document here, which is a call, it's an agenda for a general meetings of the, uh, of the Association of Atomic Bomb Survivors. And uh, it spells out the article in the agenda. As you see, uh, circle in red, um, the date is, he put 1969. However, after doing research, I can confirm that that's not the right date. To me, it, it, it feels like he went back and he added that date because the event that he describes in this document, uh, which was typed into Japanese for me by Miss uh, Midori Seino, um, happened in 1972. And um, not only because Dr. Ito uh, reports it in her chronology, and also Professor Sode reports in his chronology, but because of, we have a picture of the Rafa Shimpo as well. Uh, Dr. Maki Hiroshi's visit to Los Angeles in uh, 1972, and he appears in this picture between Okai Tomoe on the left and Dr. Noguchi on the right. So I have different timelines that I am trying to combine in order to get uh, an understanding of the events that led to the congressional hearings. And I'm getting those from the personal papers of the individuals that you see mentioned there. I'm getting from the Rafa Shimpo, which relies mostly on the Associated Press and Kyodo News in both English and Japanese, as well as their own um, journalist and reporter. And Ito, Dr. Ito Chikaku's book, which she relies mostly on the uh, main uh, Japanese newspaper. And the Hiroshima newspaper, the Chugoku Shimbun, is the one that really conveyed uh, most of the information. So in conclusion, um, was it a transnational movement, uh, this? Yes, it was, because we've seen people traveling back and forth, information traveling back and forth, individual from the United States going to Japan, from Japan going to the United States to really start, uh, start something concrete for the survivor. Did the Rafa Shimpo help me with creating an accurate timeline? Of course, yes, because I was able to find information that I had no access to before. Is my research complete? No, absolutely not. I need to go back to the Rafa Shimpo and compare and with other sources. And I did find some information, for example, in the Los Angeles Times. So this, for example, is an excerpt from the uh, the chronology that I was able to uh, put together through the Rafa Shimpo. So in September, November, September, December, 1974, we have several articles in uh, English, in sorry, in Japanese by uh, reporters in Los Angeles that write about this need for medical help to the survivors. This is a very uh, rushed uh, presentation. I hope I was able to convey uh, what this grant has allowed me to do. Um, of course, uh, thank you to the uh, National Coalition of Independent Scholars, uh, the president, interim president Amanda Hayes and the board for the research grant. Uh, all the people from the American Society of Hiroshima and Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Survivors over supporting me, Mr. Arai, Mr. Shimoda, uh, my senpai Mitsuko Yano Hayes, uh, who has helped me uh, with the translation, uh, Miss Yoshimoto and Miss Hutchinson, 
uh, they know why. And um, Naomi Hirahara, Miyuki Iwasaki, Steven Okazaki, Jerry Honda, Mariko Lindsay, Jack Dairiki K, Atabe Sheridan Tatsuno. Thank you. And also Miki Komaya, the Rafa Shimpo, and Sean Iwaka at the Japanese American National Museum. Um, they have provided a lot <laughs> of information. If you like a list of references, please send me an email and I will be happy to provide you with one. And there it is. <laughs> Thank you very much. Whoa, okay. <laughs> A fascinating talk. Thank you so much. We already have questions coming in, okay. Okay. <laughs> which is excellent. Um, uh, I was fascinated. I, I've learned so much. It's, it's wonderful. Um, first question from Sharon Beckers, and I apologize in advance for mispronouncing anybody's names. My humble apologies in advance. Um, Sharon says, what was needed to make the keyword search better? That's a very good question. And actually, it's something I need to talk to the uh, if you press the publisher uh, mm -hmm. to understand how they uh, they were able to because my understanding is they scanned that material. But the fact that um, the Japanese one was not picked up. So I need to really give them uh, the examples that I have and say, listen, this was picked up for some reason. This one wasn't. And I wonder if it, it's the quality also of the, um, because I, my understanding is that they uh, they didn't look at the paper, paper, they looked at the microfiche. So it was scanned from the microfiche. So there are several articles, for example, that uh, I wasn't able to read. And I asked several people for help to read them and it was just too faded. So that's one issue that I need to bring up. Uh, with the Eastview Press. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question. This is from Barbara Wilson, who's yeah. um, attending from England. Um, she says, I think I could see a relative rise in English language reports in your timeline slide. Is this so? And is there an explanation for this? Yes. The reason is that um, uh, the majority of the Nisei, Sansei, second and third generation, uh, Japanese Americans do not speak Japanese, do not read Japanese. And so uh, that was why the, um, the English uh, articles started appearing more. So um, that, that's a very good catch. Uh, but as you notice also, I didn't put a number uh, in my slide because I don't feel comfortable uh, until I've done a, a third look through the paper. But mm -hmm. that's a very good catch. That's the reason why uh, you will see more, uh, more of those. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Um, next question is exactly what I was going to ask too. So thanks to Brian Nia. I don't know how to say it. I do apologize. Gloria, can you help me out? Yeah, Nia, yes. Hi, Brian. Okay, it was close. <laughs> um, he says, were there significant differences in political sp perspective in coverage of the issue in the English and Japanese sections over time? It's well, fascinating because I'm a translator and you know that was exactly what I was going to ask too. <laughs> well, he, he would know because he was, he was reporting for the Rafa Shimpo. So, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, my understanding is that uh, the English section over time became a little bit more progressive and the Japanese section remained very conservative. Mm -hmm. As far as the articles are concerned, um, I, can, I can tell that they remain the most, it's really difficult to find a political position on those. Um, you will see that later on, uh, but up to the mid 1970s, you can not see much of it. And uh, I'm sure that's a, that's a conversation that, uh, that Brian and I can have uh, later on. Uh, but in my conversation and after reading about the history of the Rafa Shimpo, it seems because they're, I say they have two editors, an editor for the English section, an editor for the Japanese section, and they don't, uh, you know, they work independently. Over time, uh, it seems that has been the case uh, especially after Naomi Hirahara uh, tenure at the, uh, at the Rafa Shimpo, that the English section, it's a little bit more liberal and progressive compared to the conservative uh, side of the, uh, of the newspaper. Thank you, Brian. 
Mm. Yeah, I expect cultural differences would account for that, would you say? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, a question, well, more of a statement here from Gary Herstein, but I wonder you, you might want to comment on this. He says, OCR is tricky with English words and letters. I doubt it's simpler with Japanese. <laughs> OCR is optical character recognition. That's how you, you see, when you scan a page, the computer doesn't see text, it sees a picture. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you need to convert that picture into text. Well, yeah. 20 years, even 20 years ago, it was just bloody awful. Right. It's gotten better <laughs> in the last 20 years, but I, right. get, I, I suspect the pages you've been reading were scanned over 20 years ago. Mm. They were just scanned, those. They were just recently scanned. Well, the more okay. recent scans might or would be a little bit better, but even yeah. if you capture 98% of the characters, 2% mm -hmm. error is an enormous uh, right. gap. That's, I think that the, the problem is with the fact that uh, they did not rely on the paper copy of the newspaper. Uh, they relied on the microfiche. Which from would be newspaper. grainier than the paper, you think? From mm -hmm. the CLA. So I learned actually that uh, in order to uh, look at the paper copy of the Rafa Shimpo, it's available in the Tokyo National Library. Uh, I That's don't true. have access to that even here in the United States. Uh, yeah. UCLA only has a microfiche, doesn't even have the paper copy. But uh, I guess that uh, they received, they, re they kept them. And I mean, I had as a graduate student, she should be here on the call, actually. Uh, Crystal, I don't know if you're here, but she told me that she went to the library in Tokyo and she was able to pull uh, the uh, the paper copy of the Rafa Shimpo. So that's something that I might need to do if I can, uh, if I'm not satisfied with the- There are initiatives, for example, the Internet Archive uh, right. is extensively uh, scanning a lot of things. Is there anything like that going on in Tokyo to, to preserve the Rafa Shimpo? I don't know. I honestly don't, don't know. Because it's a Japanese American publication. So right. not much has been done here that I know. Uh, so I really don't, uh, I don't know that. That's mm -hmm. a question for, yeah, later. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you, Gary. Very interesting. Yeah. And does anybody um, have any more questions? Either put them in the chat or um, give them orally, but do speak up because I can't actually see all the participants all at the same time. So if you wave, I may not see you. Um, any more questions? Everybody's being very polite. Well, that was an absolutely fascinating talk, Gloria. So thank you so much. Can I just ask one final question? Sure. Where do you see yourself going next in terms of this research? Um, well, this presentation um, will definitely become uh, an, an article. Uh, so that's what I'm going to focus on. Um, mm -hmm. I don't see this being... Uh, um, part of the, uh, I mean, the chronology in itself, the timeline is helpful for the book, but um, the specific of the Rafa Shimpo was not part, it was not a chapter for my book. So mm -hmm. uh, I have other, uh, other things, but that need to go in there. But the chronology for me was very important to start with. So, uh, and I think that uh, the, the article in itself uh, is going to be uh, very helpful to me. Um, mm -hmm. to continue in writing the book, for sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everybody who's taken the time to attend this. Thank very you. pleased to have met you all, even thank virtually. Um, our next NCIS online event, to which you're all invited, is on creativity in research. And it will be given by um, Helen Cara, and that's on the 23rd of June. And we will make sure that that is um, promoted. Uh, Gloria, you might like to um, yes, yes. Tell, tell people about that. Yeah. Um, so it'll be lovely to see you there. And thank you so much, Gloria. Everyone. Thank you. I appreciate Wonderful. it. Wonderful. Thank you. If you'd like thank to stay on, we'll um, just have a quick word afterwards. Okay. Thank, thank you very you. much. If you'd like to unmute yourselves and give Gloria a big hand. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Bye now. I have you. a question about creativity Ooh. and research. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Can you expand on that, please? What does that mean? Um, 
Well, that's what Helen is going to tell us about. If you go to the NCIS web page and go to the resources page, there's a little introduction on there, okay, which, and, and she will explain her ethos there. But um, it is one of her um, specialisms. She's actually published a couple of books on being creative in research, and it's really interesting. So go to the NCIS website and you will find more details there. She explains it better than I can, but I'm certainly going to attend because thank, she's a very good speaker. You. Thank you. I heard about this from the San Diego Independent Scholars, which I'm part Excellent. of. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Amanda, do you need me to stay? Uh, yeah, you stay. I'll I'll end the thing and then I'll start it up again. Okay. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. Same code. Okay. Okay. <gasps> Bye. <laughs>